give you any preview, you're alive. Okay. Yo, yo. So, yo, yo, yo. Ah, hey, everybody. All right, let's see. Which one of these? Yeah, let's move this one over there. Good. So we're not getting this horrid reflection on the background. And then we're going to get our microphones. You'd think there was a way to set this up before going live, but there's not. No, there is not. Ah, hello. But we're pretty... Okay, this is pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right, there you go. Test, test. Okay, good. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, Aaron and I... Oh, there we go. Here come the comments. Sweet. Oh, by the way, do you have your yep. tablet? Yeah, let me get my tablet over here. See if this is going to work for us. <clears throat> so that we don't have to be looking at the comments like this, we're going to try to read them on Chris's tablet. Hey, hey, hey. And down goes the sound. And let's see if we can see comments or not. Oh, they might not come up on this one. Um, I think... We wait, got to be logged into yours. Um, maybe. we could do that. Oh, unless... No, wait a minute. Where's the comment? No, I should be able to see the comments. Yeah. But where... Could they be? Oh, oh live chat. chat. These wacky apps. Okay, good. Fantastic. And uh, I'm just going to grab my reading glasses so I can peer at these every now and again because they're oh so tiny on the little tablet screen. All right. Hey, Nova Scotia. Do you ever just pretend to have sponsors like... <laughs> Today's live cast brought yes. to you by brought to you by Cherry Coca Cola, Coca -Cola. <laughs> product placement. You listening, Coke? Yeah. We're here. We're here for you. <laughs> I'm gonna do that on like every video. Totally. I was like, Nike Golf, the official clothing provider of today's video. <laughs> <laughs> Your mic looks like a rubber spatula fire baking. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Yeah, we are here together um, because uh, HowdyCon is happening here in Denver, where I live and where Aaron is visiting. And so Aaron popped by for a chat here. We are holding up microphones because we are recording the audio on this also so that it's going to be posted on my Sensibly Speaking podcast later on today. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing here. So maybe a combination between like... Um answering questions and yeah, just some and things just that talking. we kind of wanted to cover. Exactly. So let's see. <clears throat> I probably, so there was something I said on one of my live streams recently. Yes. Um, and I don't remember the exact quote, but it had to do with still feeling that um, the certain parts of Scientology, particularly the lower levels, uh, my exact statements on this have been, I think everything below clear, the grades, this stuff, not including the pure. Yeah. Maybe not including the full jet. Yeah, not including pure. But the, yeah. the grades yeah. processes, um, ARC straight wire grades 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, if being used by an auditor mm -hmm. whose sole purpose really is just to help that person, mm -hmm. and if being done to someone who genuinely just wants the help and they're not being forced or in any way intimidated into getting this audit. Yeah. Um, that I've said it's really not much different than any other form of talk therapy, but I realize I'm saying that as someone who's not an expert in talk therapy. So, yeah. but, but my statements have been, um, because those subjects simply deal with, um, things everyone encounters in life. Yeah. Memory, communication, problems, transgressions, uh, change and fixed conditions. Yeah. Um, and because those processes don't involve like trying to make people guilty of having done things or trying to convince someone the things they've done are bad, like that's just not really part of those auditing actions. I've said that I think those things are helpful because I've seen people get helped uh, with it. And I'm not the yeah. kind of guy who's going to tell someone if you feel like you've been helped, I mean to make you feel like you haven't. Like exactly. that's a weird, that's a weird line to that's cross. That's right. And so um, a lot of times uh, some people will mistake me as an apologist for Scientology. And I'm like, no, 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 look, I'm just, I'm not saying I would tell someone to go do it. Right. I'm just saying that I, I, those levels is where you're at least dealing with something that can be helpful. And, but, and that's how people get in and stay in Scientology is because those lower levels, they do find them helpful. Right. When they get to the upper levels where you're really dealing with, in my opinion, things that are insanity. Um, even the idea of the state of clear is kind of insane. 
right? Even that idea of what that means to me right. is kind of insane. Well, given that the reactive mind is a fantasy. Exactly. Um, but, it, but, and then given the fact that not only can you then give a simple definition for clear, like no longer having a reactive mind, but that's, that's get, that's letting them off easy. You have everything LRH said is supposed to go along with the state exactly. of clear, which exactly. makes the whole thing just kind of insane. Right. And then the OT levels and body thetans and all that stuff. Now you're talking about pure faith, your pure faith. Precisely. So maybe I shouldn't even call it insanity. Like I don't believe it's in God or faith. heaven. I don't think Christians are insane. Right. I don't believe in body thetans. If someone does, does that make them insane? That's not really for me to say. Right. But you're getting into pure faith. Right. And at the lower levels, you're not. And that's why Scientologists don't believe Scientology is a faith-based religion. They don't believe they do have faith. They right. think they have, you know, they are evidence-based. Practical tools um, for everyday living. And I have said that when I came out of Scientology, <laughs> I actually thought that anecdotal evidence was the highest standard of evidence. <laughs> right. Have I? Have we had this conversation? <laughs> no, but I actually I, remember thinking that's not unusual. Right. That see, you know, seeing is believing. And if you've experienced it yourself, then you know it's true. How could it not be true? Right. And it wasn't until I started to, um, well, actually, uh, uh, through my company, doing research into um, publicly traded companies and doing uh, looking at clinical trials and understanding what you know, double blind men and understanding the placebo effect and understanding the controls. Yep. And like, no, anecdotal evidence is the absolute lowest standard exactly. of evidence possible. And Scientology puts out these success story videos, you know, these hilarious montages of videos set to high tempo music. Oh my God. Because Scientology does believe that anecdotal evidence is the highest standard of evidence, and that's why those videos are there. Well, and, the, and they, the, it's in their best interest for people to think that yes. what's true for you is true. Yes. Right? Yes, I mean, yes, that's, yes. They're, they're all about that. I mean, Hubbard didn't just make that stuff up. That's right. Just because. I That's mean, right. You know. And now my point to this whole thing is um, someone had commented on that. Uh, whatever yeah. I was saying along these lines, like, oh, you and Chris Shelton must not get along at all. Right. You and Chris Shelton would not like each other. <laughs> right. And I'm like. I actually like Aaron just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was two thoughts I had to that. One, I wasn't sure they were even uh, representing your thoughts correctly. Yeah. And two, my idea of a good time when I'm hanging out with my friends in the backyard isn't to sit around and talk about things we agree on. <laughs> right. I eventually will be like, okay, let's stop the idle chit chat. What are we going to argue? What can we argue about What tonight? can we argue about? Right. I want a good argument. Right. Oh no, you came here for an argument. <laughs> you're a racist. You're a fascist. You're this. Let's argue about it. All right. Um, well, let me, let me address a couple of things before we get too far along, which is that I will, I will seed, right? I will say that a certain percentage of people, yeah. and I'm not going to pretend to know what that percentage is, um, are going to respond to grade processing. Right. Okay. And I by will respond, not. What do you mean? I mean, meaning that they will have some positive response to it. They'll feel helped by it. Yeah. Right. Right. They will have a recall of memories they haven't had in a while that will, you know, spark some. Oh wow, yeah, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Or get them to look at something in a way that they haven't looked at it before, and therefore have what in Scientology is called a cognition or a new realization about life. I will say that that will happen with a certain percentage of people. I believe that repetitive processing mm. can become harmful right. no matter how well intentioned the auditor is right. and there are many grades processes that are repetitive is one command or a series of two or three commands right. given over and over and over and I believe that can induce a trance state mm -hmm. which is not healthy for people and I would say that that where it's being done that way you're dealing with potentially creating psychological problems for a person. Is it catastrophic? Are you going to put them in a straitjacket? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you're going to, when you induce a trance state in somebody, when them not knowing that that's what you're doing, you are opening the door to potentially potential problems because they don't understand what's going on. Right. And one thing I do want to say about talk therapy that from my own experience, because I have experienced some of that now, um, versus what I've learned in Scientology and what I know about Scientology, is that the is that in in talk therapy or in counseling, you're in charge. You're the one who is setting the pace. You're the one who's determining what is going to be done or not done. Okay. And in Scientology, it is the case supervisor and the auditor who are telling you what you need. True. And that is diametrically opposed to what good counseling is. So um, if the, this is probably, and I'm just going to throw my own supposition out here now, but this is probably why um, 
independent Scientologists sometimes have or feel that they have a lot more success than the church Scientology is because they're allowed to, it's all up to them what they're going to do. Right. So, and they're working with their preclear probably, I, again, I'm kind of guessing a little bit here, but probably more in line with what, you know, professional counselors would do. <clears throat> I wonder how many independent Scientologists mm -hmm. would agree with, with that statement because mm -hmm. I know a good mm -hmm. portion of them of them. I'm going to talk about them like these people. <laughs> um, you indies. I mean, my mom is an independent Scientology auditor, mm. and I know that she definitely still prides herself on using the same standard tech that she used in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never had conversations with her to be like, okay, but is there anything that you've decided not to use? Right. Um, I know she's not using any like high pressure set checking type stuff because right. they. Now you're dealing with people who actually have to want to keep coming to you. That's right. In an org, you can like really put the screws to someone and treat them like shit and sec check them and they have to keep coming back. That's right. Because yeah. you have that, that hammer of disconnection. Right. Yeah. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing that might have prompted some things, so the statements of like, oh yeah, I bet you and Chris don't get along is probably my statements that I don't really have a beef with independent Scientology. Um, not, uh, but, and, but again, people misinterpret these statements as, um, uh, advocating for it. And I'm like, no, no, no. Right. If someone can, came, can we if, not be black and white thinkers? If someone came to me and said, look, I'm having this problem. Um, no, shades of gray. If I'm having this problem. Do you think I should get, uh, what do you think I should do about it? Yeah. I would never say go get auditing. Right. But if someone said, look, um, I, I've, been the, I've been in the middle of this auditing action for a long time. I really want to finish it outside of the church. Um, uh, who would you recommend? I'd be like, okay, fine. Yeah, go, go probably see my mom get auditing or whoever. Yeah. I wouldn't say, don't do it. <laughs> Because I see it as something like if, if it, it's not being done under the high pressure of the church, yeah, um, it is being done by someone who generally just wants to help them. Yeah, they clearly it's something they want to do, and I go, I simply don't have um, either the information or the experience under my belt to justify being like you should not do that. Yeah, and it's not like I'm clamoring to have that um, change my mind about that either, um, but I don't feel like I'm ideological about it. It's simply like um, those aren't the parts of Scientology I find harmful. Yeah, and that might have been more what um, what someone felt like we absolutely would have disagreed upon. So what do you what are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, I I, I do feel that it's more harmful than helpful. Um, and well, when you say it is, what is the auditing? Just as a general subject, as it's generally done. And the reason I say that is because the more I have learned, as I was just sort of alluding to, with the more I've learned about professional counseling, like real board certified, licensed stuff. Mm -hmm the more I have found it to be the opposite of auditing. Mm -hmm. And I know from my own experience and from some of what you just said and what I've talked to with others, that, you know, especially for us who were raised with it, mm -hmm. like we never had any experience with psychology no. or psychiatry. No. We were, I mean, that was the, they were on the other side of the Berlin Wall as far as we were concerned. They were like absolutely verboten. So it's been an educational process for me to have to learn how this stuff works. And in doing that, I have seen that the basic fundamental on which auditing, Scientology auditing happens versus what, uh, you know, uh, counseling provides are so different that I would not ever say, interesting, go see an independent Scientologist. <clears throat> so right? let's, um, ju ju do that. just for the, uh, the enjoyment of getting into some details here, I'm yeah. trying to think of, um, other, I'm trying to think of any grades processes that are not repetitive. Yeah, because they almost all they almost all of them even are. even if it's a bracket of four or five questions, it's still run repetitively. That's right, and even the even the uh, yeah even the um, surfac process surfac handling mm -hmm. ARC straight wire stuff. The, oh well, uh, ARC straight wire recall no recall it, it's still recall it's still repetitive recall. Yeah, oh yeah, but you're just changing the perception. Um, you that you're recalling. Affinity, reality, communication, understanding, and the flows. Yeah. Right. Well, like, okay, ARC straight is basically memory processing. That's directly addressing a person's ability to, mem to remember things and, um, and emphasizes different perceptions. Like, you'll, okay, recall a time you ate an ice cream cone. Okay, great. I remember a time I had, you know, a, a chocolate ice cream cone. Good. What did you smell at the time? Oh, right. Right, right, right. And you put emphasis on the smell. And then the next command might be, you know, re recall a time that you felt really good driving. And you go, oh yeah, I remember this time I was cruising down the highway at 99 miles an hour, it was fucking awesome. And, they, and, you, and the auditor goes, great. Uh, what, was, what were you hearing at the time? 
right? And you put emphasis on that. So it's sort of, it's not totally repetitive right. that way. It, that's right out of the self-analysis book, right? Correct. And I think that is, I, I don't really see anything wrong with that. Sure. But you're talking right? about the absolute, absolute lowest level of auditing. I am. Right. I am. And then you get into grade zero, which is about the communication yeah. things. And even that isn't, um, uh, well, okay, uh, on grade zero, we won't go into all the details. Yeah. But you put together what you think is the most disgusting list of subjects that nobody would ever want to talk about. <laughs> right. Like, do you think it? It's on the list. Yes. In fact, there are people who pride themselves on being the specialists of putting together the raunchiest, yes. nastiest list. Yes. It, I mean, it's, if it's X-rated, it's on there. If it's not X-rated, don't even bother. That's don't right. even bother. That's right. Um, and so, but once you have the subject... I used to laugh my ass off when I had stuff in session. Oh once you have God. the subject, you're still going, okay, what would you be willing to tell me about whatever? Right. Um, what would you, about what would you eating, be willing to tell me about this? Out or what, something, what else yeah. would you be willing to tell me about this? That's and you're, right. you're still running it repetitively. To and, you, and here's my problem with the way auditing is done. Let's get to the very sure. fundamental of it, which yeah. is you know as a pre-clearer, you're indoctrinated before you even get started in auditing, that you are <clears> going <throat> to run these commands until you reach four things, right? FN, floating needle on the meter, cognition, VGIs, very good indicators. Woohoo! I'm so feel, feel so great. And uh, release, which is some subjective mental but thing. But which really doesn't right? matter because the, it's FN, COG, VGIs, and if you have those, you have a release. Exactly. Right. So you know <clears throat> that this auditing session isn't done That's right. until you demonstrate those things. So it's a preconceived, it's, it's a pre-set up situation that never, ever happens in psychology. Right. Right. Your reactions in a, in a psychology session are your reactions. And if you walk out of there in tears, that's your reaction that day. Right. right? The counselor isn't going to come running after you going, no, we're not done because you're not VGIs. Right. So in an auditing session, you cannot leave the room until you demonstrate those things. And that there's no way that doesn't no, force right. people into you're, you know, you know. you're so right. You're so right. Now, I would question whether yep. that is an example of something that an independent Scientology auditor could be could throw out the window and say, I'm not going to make the person I'm auditing sit in this chair yep. and continue the session until they're laughing. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Maybe they will. <clears throat> maybe they won't. It totally That's is right. a dice throw on this particular independent Scientologist. Now, this is a conversation I was able to have with my mom about this subject because um, I know she does lean towards that, um, uh, gravitate towards the idea that it's very evidence based and, and somewhat scientific. Yeah. And you know, talked about how how trials work, or the or positive confirmation, or positive reinforcement okay. bias, or what is it? Positive confirmation, confirmation bias. bias. Confirmation yeah. bias. Yeah. And I said, okay, so mom, do we agree that a preclear who knows what it is he's supposed to do in the session is going to progress through auditing faster? Oh, absolutely. That's a trained PC. I say, okay, so you're saying that you have to know. Yeah what's expected of you in order to be better at providing what's expected of you. That's right. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. I'm like, okay, good. And do you agree that LRH says Scientology only works if it's being done on someone who's cooperating and wants it to work? Mm -hmm. She absolutely agreed. Absolutely, I agree with that statement. Okay, yep. good. Well, if you say that something only works if you want it to work, that is the opposite of science. Exactly. Right. And we got to that point yep. where you, where she's like, okay, I, I see why you say that. I, I see what you're saying. I see whatever. And I was like, okay, good. And I said, look, that's not the same thing as me saying you're not helping people. Exactly. Because the placebo yes. effect is real. And the truth is I think, I think if you were to take 100 people and put them through the grades processes with no stress, no money donated or anything like that. Yeah. I, I think you're probably going to get more people saying they were helped than from a sugar pill. That's the kind of experiment where you're going to get that percentage right. I was talking about. Exactly. Right. And how awesome would it be if someone decided to take Dianetics and Scientology processes and put them to the scientific method if only just for the fun of it. somebody would do that. Is someone doing that? Oh. oh. <laughs> but if... It would it know. would be hilarious. I actually know a guy who said he wanted to do that, but I don't know how serious he was. It would just be it would just be funny. It would be. It would because, be funny. Yeah. Not because I'm like, oh, someone should test it because it's going to prove it. No, I'm just saying it would be interesting to finally do what L. Ron Hubbard claimed to have done. That's right. Um, Scientifically validated right. mental health therapy. Right. Because I said, Mom, we can have this conversation all day long, and, and and I can feel like I'm trying to get you to admit Scientology doesn't work, but that's not what I'm trying to get you to admit. I'm trying mm -hmm. to get you to admit that 
um, <clears throat> it, it's not been subjected to the scientific method. And even if you audited a thousand people and you saw a thousand people get better, that is still not the scientific method. That's right. Um, you still have confirmation bias happening in a session. And That's I can right. remember so many times when um, I was in an auditing session, receiving an auditing session, and it was l lunchtime was coming up. That's right. And it was, and I knew it, or, or dinner time was coming up, yep. and I knew it was hamburger day, or I knew it was dessert yep. day. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not going to be stuck in this auditing session during That's dinner time. Right. And I was, and I'd be real in a real bad mood, and I'd be like, okay, I can't be in a bad mood right now. This isn't going to work. I've got to, I've got to like come up with something good. Yeah. And I would make myself be happy and have some realization so I could get the fuck out of the auditing session and go have some hamburgers and ice cream. That's what I'm talking about. And that is a very, very good point. Yep. Um, I cannot think of an example off the top of my head right now of an auditing action or an auditing process that is just open-ended question where you can just answer it however you want and it's not repetitive. There are questions you can answer however you want, but it's repetitive. Okay, get uh, this. Yeah. A sec check me. Well, you can answer however you want. You can. You can. And it's earlier similar, not repetitive. Well, that's true, but that's that's. I, I think that's even obviously worse. Oh no, I'm not. I'm, I'm yeah. not saying sec checking is a good thing. Right. But it's non-repetitive process. Right. And here's. I mean, we're we're preaching to the choir here, but where where I feel like that is so obviously worse is yeah. you have the auditor using this device, the e meter, mm -hmm. to be the determier, the arbiter, arbiter of whether what you're saying. Is true, is or, true not. or not? Exactly. Holy fucking shit! That is so messed up. It's beyond fucked up. It is so messed up. Yeah. And then you'll be told you'll be you could be asked a ridiculous question like, "Have you ever worked for the CIA?" And you're 15 years old and you've been in Scientology your whole life, and you're like, "No." And the auditor's like, "Well, what did you think when I asked you the question?" Mm -hmm. Well, I thought no. <laughs> well, okay. What other thought did you have when I asked the question? Yep. I thought fuck no. I thought you're an idiot. I thought you're. I thought this is stupid. We'll have a missed withhold on you. Exactly. That's right. That's where exactly where that's going. And so, oh really? I'm not, stupid. The auditor is not even allowed to exercise judgment. Now, there's many auditors I know who would disagree with that statement, but yeah. whatever. Well, they're gonna throw in protest, and they're gonna start false you know, reads, start false reads, read. and all that kind of stuff. But right. it's a circular thing. It just goes round and round and round. And but you're but the fundamental point you made. The meter is the thing that tells what the truth is, not the person you're talking to. Right. There is no way that's not going to screw somebody up. Right. Or force them, force them to make up answers to satisfy the auditor exactly. and the e-meter, rather than doing something that is in their benefit. Exactly. And even if someone can't find an answer to the question, because there literally isn't one in the present lifetime, they're then forced to delve Make into in the past lives. delve into past lives, mm -hmm. and that is, I'm sorry, even if you believe in past lives, that's one thing, but to get someone to the point where they think any random thought or imagination that they have is actually a recall of a past life incident, that's delusion. That is trained delusion. That's right. And that's what happens. And I always push back on that in my experience in Scientology. I never was willing to run past life incidents. I, I pretended to do it twice just to get the fuck out of the auditing session. Oh, wow. Never, you know, and it was only like the, the past, the, the most recent past life. It <laughs> yeah. wasn't like in a fucking yeah. spaceship or something. I never had that option because I had a thousand hours of FPRD. Yes. And yes. false purpose rundown. Yes. It's the thing, it's, it's what looks for evil purposes that you have uh, created and acted on in the far, far distant past. Because Hubbard says that the stuff that really messes you up it has nothing to do with what's going on right now. It has right. to do with the stuff when you blew up planets 10,000 million years ago. That's right. So false purpose rundown goes after that stuff. And uh, and I had, when you're when you're doing the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, it's all it's just about exclusively uh, FPRD, false purpose rundown, and that is not you. You've got to go past lives in order to be taken seriously when you're doing that auditing. All right, so we're confusing people with a lot of the terminology. VGI stands for Very Good Indicators, which, Sorry, just, which really just means happy and cheerful. That's right. Very Good Indicators. Right. So, An indicator is something you see. So Very Good Indicators are something you're seeing with the pre-clear that are right. good, right? Eyes sparkly and uh, muscle <laughs> muscle tone optimum. That's right. Muscle, muscle tonus. Eyes muscle right, tonus. Yes. Eyes bright. <laughs> and, um, I'm surprised you didn't say shit like hair standing on end, you know? Basically, happy. Exactly. VGIs is Scientology's term for 
happy. happy. That's right. Um, and FN just means floating needle, which the needle kind of goes back and forth like this on the meter, and that's supposed to mean you're done with the process. Right. Um, all right, let's see. Come on, you guys. Get with it here. you got to keep up. How does Scientology justify <laughs> saying that they lived in some ancient culture, let's say the Aztec Empire, Empire when they cannot speak said culture's language? No. Oh. Oh, well, you're, you're giving God. it way too much thought. I mean, I if know. you think about it that much, you might doubt whether these experiences are real. No one's ever regained yeah. a, a foreign language through their contact with their past life memories. That's right. Because you know, if you're contacting your past lives, you should be contacting everything about that life, not just, That's I right. remembered something I did. That's right. You should remember the language. You yeah. should. Or the skills you had, right? The skill set. Right. And that would hardly ever happen. Chris, oh, this is, I want to talk about this. Chris, in the past, you said that you have gone exterior. Did Aaron ever get that? Did you ever experience going exterior in Scientology? I, Let's define exterior. Okay, first off, yeah, an out-of-body experience. Okay, like you as a spiritual being suddenly have an awareness beyond just seeing through your eyes. You're seeing things from the corner of the room, or you're floating, you're flying off to Mars or something like that. That would be, in Scientology parlance, that's being exterior to your body. Most commonly, you're looking down at your body from some angle. Yep. Like it's not just fl flying through the universe. Usually, you're looking at your body. Yes. Okay, so tell us. Oh, but, okay. and, and this is a big but, uh, Hubbard said uh, early on, like early 50s, when he was first screwing around with this stuff, that it wasn't required that you see things in order to be exterior. If you felt like you were exterior, you were exterior. And so I felt many times that I was exterior in Scientology, but never from the... Did I see things from an external point of view? When I said I was exterior in Scientology, it's because I felt bigger. I felt like I was pervading the room. I, I felt like my skin was, my hair was on end, you know, and I was like, woo, I feel so good right so now. So you fucking cheated. I totally cheated. I, yeah. I, I never called that exterior. <laughs> see, and I did because I fell back to Hubbard's thing of you don't have to see. I never read that. Yeah. I yeah, never yeah. Read that. But any perception will do, and so my perception of size was me feeling that way, and right. I would, and and if I needed an FN, if I needed to get out of an auditing session, I would remember that point, that how that felt. Yeah. Ooh, you so know. I absolutely had moments in auditing. Yeah. Um, where I felt that amazing yep. where I was like I felt like oh my god how can I not be popping out of my head right now <laughs> yeah. you just feel huge you feel like you can occupy tons of space you just feel ecstatic it's like almost a euphoria yep. feeling yeah. it is it's definitely and, euphoria and Scientologists claim to go exterior or be exterior particularly Scientologists who've done the OT levels all the time yep and yet I have said recently I have never spoken with a Scientologist, who's been able to convince me it was true. Well, it's funny because it's even the EP of one of the L's. Full, stable exterior at will. That's right. Yeah. And I've, and that's total bullshit. <laughs> of course it it's is. total bullshit. It's total bullshit. I mean, I have never in 20 years spoken to a Scientologist who convinced me they either were or actually had gone exterior. Oh. Because I, I mean, like actually convinced me. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, like for, like, let's say you and I, in, if we were both still in Scientology, yep. would have never had the discussion of what you meant when you said you'd gone exterior. Correct, and that's the thing, because as far as the convincing part goes, right? When you're in Scientology, you do not challenge other people. You don't about have to that. prove your exterior. No, all no. you got to do is say it. Yeah. And, and in fact, there is another quote, and I'd have to dig it up, but you know, Hubbard flat out said early on. If somebody says they're exterior, they're exterior, period. That's right. And he was actually admonishing auditors for challenging the pre-clears because right. this was a thing in the 50s. It was a much more loosey-goosey back then. But, P but Hubbard was all about trying to get people popped out of their heads. And he was giving them commands like, you know, be three feet back of your head or try not to be three feet back of your head. All these kind of goofball commands to get people to pop out because he thought... In 1953, 54 time period, that was how you would, right. you know, electrify people. You know, this is an important subject because the very concept of exteriorization mm -hmm. is the fundamental essence of what Scientology is all about. It is the faith. It is the point. thing. It That's is the right. thing. And the fact right. that I 
had never come close to feeling like I was exterior. Um, and the fact my, I never even considered that feeling fantastic and feeling huge would even count. Yeah. Um, it was always a problem for me. It, and, it was and always a problem yeah. for me that I had never gone exterior. And, 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 and interest, it, even thinking about it right now, it required so much more faith on my part to mm. stick in as long as I did. That's right. Right? Because it's, it's the fundamental right. point of faith That's right. is that you are a spiritual being. That's right. And the proof of that is pop out of your head once. Woo! So you're Chris, a let, let's stick yeah. on this for a little bit. Yeah. Because Jason, uh, two things I'm going to mention. A story Jason Begay told in his interviews yeah. and a story one of my um, friends who's still in Scientology had told. Jason said that one of the things that uh, uh, really um, locked him into Scientology early on was he was doing the communication drills mm -hmm. and went exterior. Yes. And one of my, 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 one of my previous best friends, he said that when he was on the purification rundown, and I'm realizing the communication drills is a somewhat stressful environment. Yep. Purification rundown, somewhat stressful environment. That's right. He said he went exterior, and at that point, he says, I don't give a shit if David Miscavige beats people up every day. He says, I don't give a shit if LRH was a bigamist a liar, um, a war criminal. I don't care. Yep. Because I went exterior. Yep. And I know I'm an immortal spiritual being, and I want to reap whatever benefits of this um, technology L. Ron Hubbard left behind. I don't care if half of it's bullshit. I'm going to do all of it so that I can get whatever I can from it because I went exterior. Yep. So there's nothing you can, this is what my, my friend was saying, yep. there's nothing you could say to me to get me to walk away from Scientology or to pick my friends over Scientology or to pick my family over Scientology because none of those things matter. Because I went exterior 30 fucking years ago on the purification rundown. I but guarantee you he's but, never been exterior since. But Scientology doesn't make narcissists. <laughs> so but let me ask Chris, because yeah. then this begs the question, if someone does go exterior yep. or feels that they do, yep. Are they experiencing something or are they experiencing a delusion? Well, here's what I would, here's what I'm very keenly curious about, which we're not going to be able to answer here, but I am, I'm, I'm very interested in exactly what happened. What did they experience? Because yes. I'm, I will bet you any amount of money that what happened was in the sauna, especially in the sauna. Yes. Uh, and I've done a whole video on that. We're not going to regurgitate it all here, but it is dangerous. Um, you know, you're going to suffer heat stroke, heat exhaustion. I mean, it is, it is, it is a very realistic, uh, idea or supposition on my part that somebody on the purification rundown could have been suffering from one of those two things. Right. And in a communications course, you are absolutely without question being put in trance states, mm -hmm. right? With, with OTT or zero, especially with TR zero. Let's define some of these things. OTT oh, sorry, or zero yeah. is when you're... Um, sitting in a chair, across from someone else sitting in a, in a chair, but you're sitting there just with your eyes closed. Right. And then TR0 is when you're sitting there with your eyes open looking at the other person. That's right. For hours. For hours. Yeah, this is not for a couple minutes. Yeah. Right? So in both of those conditions, you are you have lots of reasons to think that the person's going to be, excuse me, not fully uh, using their faculties. And I'm curious whether something happened to them that threw them off or made them wonder in some way and somebody said to them, oh, that sounds like you went exterior. Right. Right? And there's the interpretation of the experience in a positive light with a positive suggestion, which could even be considered a post-hypnotic suggestion. And the person is now absolutely certain that's what they experience. There's no other possible interpretation for it, and therefore Scientology works. And I will leave my family and my friends and everything else in this world because of this positive interpretation of what occurred. Right. Um, it's impossible to keep up with all the questions. Yeah, obviously. I know they're coming in fast. And okay, curious. but I did see the question come in earlier, asking if I had received the links that they emailed me, um, uh, linking to things that uh, proved Ellen Hubbard was a racist. Let's talk about this. I do oh, not think yeah. L. Ron Hubbard was, was a racist. What, let's, oh, I do. Let's start from there. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> no, you're wrong. No, here's, 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 uh, okay. I don't think that He was L. Ron 1950s Hubbard, racist. Well, here's the thing. L. Ron Hubbard, <laughs> let's, look, uh, let's put it in full context. Yeah. L. Ron Hubbard was born in 1911 and tilled in Nebraska. He was raised in the Midwest. We know from his journals and uh, from when he was a kid 
that when he was over in China, he was calling them chinks, right? That, that the, 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 only, you know, the only bad thing about, Chinese is the, you know, about China is all the chinks here, right? Now, is that racism? Yes, it is. It is, <laughs> right? Because he is devaluing... I'm going to come off looking at like the racist in this video. <laughs> well, he's right. devaluing an entire right culture. Oh, no, we don't have to argue whether it's a racist word. Yeah. It's well, a racist it word. But here's the thing. If you're raised... Okay, it's like this. Okay, it's like this. If you're raised in a, in a culture of institutional racism... Yes. Are you a racist? Yes, you are. Now, are you a... Do you hate those do people? Do you hate those people? Probably. Maybe, 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 maybe not. not. Right. So let's... Okay, let's talk about this. Because it's important. Is racism. Because again, again when, when, when me and my friends are in our backyard um, yeah. having our arguments, at the end of the night, we almost always realize... We're not arguing over the concepts. We're arguing over the definitions of the terms we're using. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to use myself as an example. Okay. Okay. So I grew up. We're going to do some word clearing. I, I grew up. <laughs> no, I, I mean I mean like when you say a word, you yeah. are thinking certain things. And when I say a word, I'm thinking certain No, no, things. I get okay. it. Yeah. So I grew up um, outside of Philadelphia, Malvern, Pennsylvania, uh, upper middle class. Um, we weren't upper middle class, but in upper middle class suburbs. Yeah. And it was a thing in the schools that I went to. To, um, to call someone a Jew as a derogatory word. Mm -hmm. Don't be such a Jew. Stop being, oh, if someone asks you for money, oh, stop being such a Jew. Or someone wants some food off your plate, oh, don't be such a Jew. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even know this, what, like it was used as a derogatory word. Mm -hmm. And so it became part of my lexicon. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's just what all the people would say to each other. I didn't dislike Jewish people. It didn't even occur to me that the word we were using would be offensive to, I don't even know if I was aware of Judaism. Like, right. I, like I just don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. And I remember we were visiting my dad in Minnesota um, on a summer vacation, and we are in the backyard, and uh, in the backseat of the car, and me and my brother were fighting, and one of us said to the other one, like, you damn Jew! <laughs> and my dad goes, what are, what, what are you guys, bigots? And we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. Okay, right. so this is just an example of, Okay, if you're being raised in an in a, in, that's in the institutional racism. If if, mm -hmm. if calling someone a Jew is a derogatory term, it is. That's institutional racism. That's right. But then you have uh, how that um, manifests itself in children that grow up in it. I'm not a racist. I don't. I, I consider myself Jewish. My name is Aaron Levin. If my mom didn't, didn't insist on putting her name in there, yeah. My name is Aaron Levin. My grandfather was a German Jew. Mm -hmm. And um, and so you go. But but I don't think it's fair to say. That of course that use of the word is racist. Exactly. Okay. Someone who would use that word because they grew up doing it. I'm not. I don't think it's fair to say the person's a racist. Using the word is a racist thing. Okay. It's not fair to say the person's racist. I wasn't any. I wasn't any more racist then as a child using that word, not realizing what it meant, than I am now. Well, I would never do that. Okay. I wasn't more racist then. Like that didn't make me racist. Yeah. Um, because racism is really honestly about what's in your heart and your actions. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I guess you could say what's in your heart. If you discriminate against somebody, even though you like them, you're still demonstrating right. racism in my, in my opinion. But I think racism is more about what's in your heart and your head. It's well, whether you I genuinely would, yeah. feel that you're superior to these other races or think these other races are inferior to you. Now, would you agree that, that being raised with terminology like that would create a proclivity towards... Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the danger. Now, so here's the problem, and I'm sorry, you guys, we can't see your comments right now, but we're just going to talk this out. The, the links that, um, that the person sent me uh, didn't convince me. Uh, so let's say that LRH used the N-word in a letter to Mary Sue 50 years ago. Which he did often. Uh, uh, often? Yeah. In written word or yeah. spoken word? Headley told me they've edited it out of so many letters. Get the fuck out. Headley and I are going to do a podcast. We're going to talk about this. Oh. Oh yeah. Okay. People because, have no idea. Because again, my position on this is not ideological. It's not going to crush my soul if it turns out LRH was a racist. I just am not going to cross that line until I, I, I go. Okay. So uh, until well, I'm convinced. That, well, well, hold on. Hold on. Let me explain. Okay. One, one thing. Right. One thing. Okay. So um, I go if okay. So uh, again, I'll just continue to use myself as an example. Okay. This this neighborhood that I grew up in was a mostly white neighborhood. Yeah. Um, by virtue of being a a white man in. Tampa, Florida, with mostly white people. Most of my friends are white. Mm -hmm. In my experience, you get a lot of white people together. They tend to tell jokes mm -hmm. about other races, and it's kind of funny. And if blacks get together and they want to tell jokes about white people, it's kind of funny. Like, mm -hmm. the jokes don't make you racist. Okay? okay. That's not, it depends on what's okay. in your heart. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, if LRH, uh, white men in the 30s and the 40s and 50s 
were, were they, they were like all fucking racist. Well, they were, but here's why. In, you talk about in your heart and in your mind, right? Yeah. Okay. Language is powerful. Language creates what's in our heart and mind in many, many ways. Totally Not agree. The values we're raised with create what we call implicit bias. It's a bias you have that you don't even know you have. Now, let me just finish I don't the disagree thought, with that. Right? Yeah. Now, here's where this goes, and it's so easy to go there right. because of human nature that this is why um, language is something to pay attention to. When L. Ron Hubbard was in China, right, as a child, he felt superior to these people, the, the Chinese. That's evident. And it was very evident in yeah. the way he talked about them. Right. Whether he used the word chink or not, right. it was very clear that he felt superior because he yeah. came from early, 19th, early 1900s Midwest America, yeah. where he, maybe his dad... Maybe his mom, maybe his culture, whatever, maybe a teacher he had. For whatever reason, L. Ron Hubbard got the idea that people who were not as he was were subordinate that's to true. him. That's true. That's certainly true. And that's racism. I get what you're saying. Right? And so we, okay. we watch language, right. not because we're trying to be tone police or language police, but because it creates no, you're right. a, a thinking. You're right. So my thing is when I think of racism, I immediately go on uh, black versus white racism. Yeah. Um, and I would absolutely agree on the, um, uh, you know how to say oriental anymore? The Asian racism. Yeah, he definitely spoke about the Asian cultures as sort of being subcultures. Very much but so. But here's the thing. And, and, and again, I, I will admit right here that the L. Ron Hubbard I know is almost certainly not the true L. Ron Hubbard because of how sanitized his presentation has been to Scientology. Big time. Um, but saying, ha having said that, yeah. um, in the 55 million words <laughs> yeah, that Marty that, loves that Marty to use, claims is, yes, I have never total. read one thing that to me sounded racist against black people. Now, I, I, so, so there's the letters he wrote to Mary Sue where I think he used the N-word. Yep. Yeah. And then there's this letter to um, South Africa, letter to the South African government that people like to point to. Yep. And I think one thing that I'm not sure if people totally get it is South Africa is like the whitest fucking country on the African continent. South Africa is pretty much a white country. Okay. Um, so I'm not, and he might have been writing, he's, uh, uh, okay, let me, here's what, uh, uh, when, when Ellery talks about the South Africans, he's talking about the whites as well. There is an auditing rundown in Scientology called the South African Rundown. Yeah. That's done on anyone from South Africa, regardless of the color of their skin. Okay. And in fact, there's almost no black South Africans in Scientology because the blacks in South Africa are poor and the whites in South Africa are rich. That's true. And the only South Africans I know in Scientology are well-off white people and they get the South African Rundown. And so I think people somewhat confuse things that LRH said about South Africans and think he's talking about blacks. Possibly, and I, possibly. And, and I will only say right now as I sit here that I would have to review those materials yeah. to be sure that right. what you just said is true. Sure. Because I know now, I do know that he did have specific things he said about black South Africans. Okay. Uh, about their ability to learn, for example. Right. I, I'm, I'm sure of this. But I'd have to go back and look at the material. And again, this is when we want to get into the definition of racism. Yeah. If it, it is possible, I say possible only because I don't know it's impossible, mm -hmm. that it, with the institutional problems in South Africa, that the black South Africans did have extra challenges and barriers, not because of the color of their skin, but because of the socioeconomic pressures they've been, um, uh, you know, uh, had been put upon them for the last hundreds of years in that country. Mm -hmm. I've never heard LRH say anything about the problems in, in a black community or whatever is because of the color of their skin or their inferior DNA or, you know, something that makes it sound like as a race, they're just, I mean, look. It, let's, well, there is that HCLB also about about what to, 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 the, to the black Scientologists, the black community, or something. It's not black Scientologists. It, it was, was Afri It was African American. Right, and but the truth said. is, the continent of Africa yeah. has problems very unique to that continent, and it's easy to say that if you're talking about African problems, you're talking about black problems. But LRH wasn't talking about 
blacks. Just blacks. He was talking about Africa ins, <laughs> not black Americans, not all blacks. The people in Africa, and Africa is a fucked up nation. Well, fair enough. I'd right. have to, I'd have to look at the material. Okay. Again because, but to get back to the point of Hubbard specifically, I think his own writing as a young man yeah. indicate that he had a white privilege problem. We, we can right. absolutely agree we on that. We can agree on that. Sure. And I don't see, and here's my thing, is I, I don't see any reason to extend him the benefit of the doubt towards blacks, right, whether African or not, because of his attitude towards the Chinese, which I am, am a thousand percent sure of. Wait, but hold on now. Hold I, on now. I'm just saying where's that the, I don't where's see Where's the doubt even the, coming in? Like, where's the, where, you said not extending the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. But where's the doubt? Like... Okay, uh, could could he? Is it possible for someone to be racist in private and not racist in public? Well, if you're racist, you're racist. No, but I mean, like, if 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 LRH and again, I mean, I, I, I realize I, that many of the Scientology materials are obviously sanitized, but I'm saying they are. We've read thousands and thousands of pages of his writing and yeah. hundreds and hundreds of hours of his lectures. Yeah, I've never heard him say one derogatory thing about black people ever. So when someone says LRH was a racist, I'm like, well, then he was a damn good one because how can I agree with a statement that LRH was racist against blacks? Okay. I'll, instead of just saying racist, I'll say racist against blacks. Okay. How can I agree with the statement that LRH was racist against blacks when in 20 years and everything I've studied in Scientology, I've never read one negative thing about a black person or okay. heard him say one negative thing. How can I add these, put these things together? I, I, and I, and if, and if you haven't, then I, there's nothing I could say that would but, but you have. try to convince you of that. But what I'm have. saying is that having read what I did read about yeah. his attitude towards Chinese. Asian right, people, Asians, yeah. um, I have no reason to give him the benefit of the doubt toward other races. Understood. I think he was a. I think he was Mr. White Privilege. I think he was raised that way. I think it was a cultural thing for him. Sure. Um, I don't necessarily uh, feel emotionally that I need to, um, you know, cut him slack. Well, sure, and that. I don't want to cut him slack either. Right. But there's a difference between cutting someone slack and just being like, oh yeah, he was a racist. I, I've never seen him or heard him do anything racist against blacks. But sure, yeah. I'll I'll jump on that on that bandwagon. Did Did you ever read or listen yeah. to something in a Scientology book or a bulletin or a lecture that sounded racist against black people? As I sit here right now, nothing's coming to mind. Okay, good. We can totally just leave it at that. We can leave it at that. Because I am completely willing to believe yeah. that in private, he was a raging racist. I agree. I, it wouldn't even surprise me. Right. Because he was so privileged and raised in a time where it was so normal to be casually racist. Right. Do you know what I mean? That's right. So, okay. That's right. And but that and, doesn't make Scientology but, racist. No, not Scientology. Okay, because that no. gets seeped into it. Yeah, no. Scientology okay. in and of itself Scientology is not has racist. a lot of racists in it, yeah. but it doesn't make the body of, of work racist. Right. Okay. Right. And I think you're going to get a shitload of comments now about <laughs> schooling you on South Africa. I'm, I'm predicting that is what's going to occur. All right. Well, I'm sure I know more South Africans than anyone watching this goddamn video, unless you're in South Africa. Okay. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing Wait, on that one. Many of my friends are South African. Okay. I'm totally kidding. Yeah, I know. I'm kidding. I know. Okay, I know. what do we have here? Um, what do you guys think of the BS? I don't want to talk about Marty. We've spoken about Marty so oh much. Oh, my God. Okay, Marty. Please, no more Marty. All right. Um, shirts can have buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a joke about you always wearing t-shirts? I don't know. Um, I am always wearing t-shirts. Is this frozen? Uh, it's, no, it's It's not. just cycling. Uh, okay, we're gonna oh scroll God. up what's to what's answer questions. What did we miss? Aaron has stated before that he enjoys playing the devil's advocate. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, I'm absolutely yeah. playing the devil's advocate. Um, LRH was stupid. To I think you know. Actually, <laughs> another thing that I will say about Hubbard that just occurred to me though that's probably important in this conversation about racism is uh, Hubbard had. I think the word is megalomania. Sure. Hubbard had a a self worth, a, a, an estimation of his own value that put him above everyone else, period. It didn't matter who you were. So, you know, racist, narcissist, like just about any ist you can come up with probably applies to the man in one fashion or another. And we can go back and forth as to why that was that way, whether it was his culture, or whether he was raised that way, or whether he personally felt that way. Excuse me. In the end, we know that the guy thought he was better than everybody else. Period. White, black, Chinese, 
didn't even particularly enter into it. But I think that because of his cultural upbringing, it was just kind of burned into him. So Sure. Um, okay, just a bunch of stuff here. Um, was LRH pro-apartheid? I don't... When I was in Scientology, I'm not even sure I knew what apartheid was, so... He <clears> wrote <throat> that constitution for, what, Zimbabwe? Uh, Rhodesia? When he went down there? He rewrote a constitution that was one man, one vote. Uh, in an effort to try to bring equality, uh, you was know, he pro -apartheid down there. Though? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know as I sit here right now. Yeah. Can't remember. Um, Africa is not a nation. I wasn't literally calling Africa a nation. I was just saying the African right. continent is a pretty messed up... Um, I mean, is it not? I mean, I don't know. I've never yeah. been. They have problems. Third world problems. They do. And, and it's not because and the, of the color of their skin. I'm... I, I would not go there. Wait, because, when I, when I say not because the, the, the subjugation of the people of Africa by white people. No, col if they've been su it's no. Let me. Th if they've been yeah. sub, they've been subjugated yeah. because of the color of their skin. What I mean yeah. is, I mean that happens. Someone who is racist would say, no, no, they're that way because there's some glass ceiling on what blacks can achieve, and they can never. The blacks are that way because you show, the a, a racist would say. No, Africa is like that because they're uncivilized and they can't they can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps any right. further than they've already done. And a lot of people have said that. Well, right, and that's a racist position to hold. Very much. Yeah. My point was, they're they're oppressed because of the color of their skin. Yes. Their lot in life is not be. I realize it, I have to use a better word. Their yeah. lot in life isn't because that's all someone with that skin color can achieve. Their lot in yeah. life is because of they're being oppressed due to the color. Correct. That is right. correct. They're, yes. they're, they're, it's the result of racism. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, I don't want to have the whole thing go off into racism. It was just this concept of whether LH is a racist. And it's yeah. interesting because I, I still feel like at the end of this conversation, we're holding two somewhat opposing views. One, mm -hmm. we agreed that neither of us have read or listened to a word LRH wrote in the name of Scientology that sounded racist against blacks. Yeah. But at the same time, I do get the impression that you're in the camp that Elrich was racist against blacks. I, I believe he was. But how can both of those things be true? Because of the way he, because of his upbringing. Like we've agreed that well, no, he was you're, raised. You're in saying he's predisposed to being racist. racist. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got it. That's yeah. it. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, and, and that's fine. Like and given I, a choice, and I agree, he's, he's going to think less yeah. of anybody who's not it. white. I got it. Sure. But then if that's true for everyone, then that the, the doesn't mean anything. If it was true for everyone in that period, then no, it doesn't... It meant, it meant something. In this, but, okay. but you're saying the reason it would have been that way is because he was raised in that time period. But if that was true for everybody, then in that time period... It makes the time period a racist time period. Okay, but singling or one person... Race, the Midwest But, but it just means that singling was, one person out as being racist is almost meaningless then. It, yes and no. Okay. When you have somebody with as much influence as Alron Hubbard had right. over okay. other people... Okay. Fair enough, fair yeah, enough. it matters. Um, how long have we been going, by the way? I'm oh, it doesn't matter because, um, I can't see my battery power. Whatever. <laughs> it looks like 52.48. Oh, sweet. Not bad. Yeah. All right, guys. Give us some good questions here. <laughs> <sighs> I've read tons of... Oh, no. Miscavige is absolutely a racist. Oh, uh, that wouldn't... Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, absolutely he is. Because when you hear Render and Raffin and these, I mean, oh, he yeah. was just, he's a homophobe, he's a racist. I mean, just every, again, every hist you can think of pretty much applies to the guy. Okay, I'm going to scroll up looking for questions, y'all. Um, when did either of you first find something in Scientology boring? What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Um, race is a minefield as a topic. We should probably move on. <laughs> It is. Yeah, we're it trying is. to move on, guys. We're yeah. trying to move on. Trying to be clear about it, but... Uh, uh, uh. Oh, I wanted to ask you a question about something. Yeah. Just the other day, I was remembering when I first got into Scientology, uh, when I was 15, 16 years old, and I was doing um, the Pro TRs course. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I was getting my first word clearing because I had my first major disagreement mm. with the materials. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And... Um, and so I was protesting. Mm -hmm. I, was a, I was being, you know, not a critical thinker, but I was like, this line doesn't make sense, and I wasn't giving it up. I wasn't like, oh, but Hubbard knows what he's talking about, and this is my first course, right? And the supervisor browbeat me mm -hmm. into submission, right? And I was, again, I was 15, so I was impressionable. I had grown people around me who were like, you're wrong, Hubbard's right. 
and um, and I was forced through method nine word crane, which is where you sit and have to read it out loud to somebody else. And anytime you make a mistake in your reading, you have some word you need to look up in a dictionary. So I was being forced through this method to agree with what Hubbard was saying. And I wanted to ask you if you had ever thought about that happening to you. So I was much more self-motivated on a, well, that's probably the wrong word. Um, to do that handling on myself instead of allow anybody to try to do it on me. Even the first time? Because I, what I remembered was this was I the first time and after this, right. I handled myself. Oh no, you're absolutely right. The first time you have that 10 minute conversation with the supervisor where you're going, but this doesn't make any sense. And, right. and all he's doing is saying, well, what word didn't you fully understand? And you're like, can we stop playing games here? Can you answer my fucking question? Right. And he's like, well, what word didn't you fully understand? And you're like, so you don't know the answer either? Right. And like, well, what word didn't you fully understand? Well, if you would just explain it to me, then I would understand it. Right. What word didn't you fully understand? Oh, this is how we're going to play this fucking game? That's right. What word didn't you understand? Okay, fine, thanks. Go away. I'll, I'll figure it out for myself. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. And then I probably never asked a supervisor for, never asked a question exactly. of a supervisor ever again. Exactly. <laughs> That's, I wanted to ask, I wanted to compare notes on that because yeah. we were both supervisors. Yeah. So we knew we were trained into the drill on how to deal with students who had questions. That's right. But way earlier than that, you know, it was just something that I was like, oh yeah, that's where it happened. Now, interestingly yeah. enough, as a course supervisor, yeah. I took much more liberty with my students. Because it was just common sense to me that yeah. if I understand it and you don't, I can help you understand it. That's right. And you very well may have a misunderstood word and I'm going to help you find it. Yeah. But I'm also going to help you understand what the fuck you're reading. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And I was also very aware, oh, this so speaks to the, to the, the mentality and the thought stopping in Scientology, that I could not do this if, people, if other people were around. Yes. If I had yes. anyone senior to me in the organization yes. around, you, you I just, could not. What's your word? What's your word? That's I could, right. I, could, I had my hands tied. I could not yep. sit there and talk to them about what they were studying and maybe give them some examples of this and examples of that. Right. I, and, and so I didn't like it when other people were around because I wanted the freedom and the latitude and the liberty to to actually discuss the material with them and help them. Very good point because yeah. I did the exact same thing. That's right. That's right. And right. in the Sea Org, there was a time when uh, most of my Sea Org career, I was not supervising a course room, um, but there was a time when I was supervising um, the EPF, which the, 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 it's Sea the, Org boot camp. Yep. And what happens is a lot of Sea Org members who are failing will actually be put back onto the EPF. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I would try to be as helpful with those guys as I would with brand new people, and they would fucking write reports on me. Exactly. The, pe the students I was helping understand their materials would write reports on me that I was interpreting their materials for them, when I absolutely was not right. interpreting their materials for them. Right. And so then I'd be like, huh, oh, fuck you then. That's right. <laughs> Hey, next time you got a problem, I'm just going to be Mr. Rope's supervisor with exactly. you, buddy. Exactly. Yep. Um, there was something else that um, I was hoping to touch on, and I think it totally left my mind. Ah. Yeah. Good times. Um, well, let's see. Oh, I think it was a question that I saw. Okay, well, how about this? Aaron, how has your wife handled the disconnection from her family? Women tend to be more emotional, and I'm sure it has been hard on her and your girls. I mean, I, I've said over and over again that everything that has happened she, she has been so much worse on her than it has been on me. Uh, she suffered so much more through all of this. Like, um, the only family member that is disconnected from me is my younger brother. He's six years younger than me, and I don't mind saying that during my entire life he's always been a terrible brother. And I'm not just saying that because he disconnected. Like, he's literally one of these family members that you would get together at family dinners and be like, what's wrong with this person? And, and, I mean, uh, and, and is also, he, he's in, uh, he joined the Sea Org when he was like 11 or 12. He was oh. RPF'd at 14. Oh my God. He, he was on the RPF for years before being offloaded from the RPF, which is quite rare actually. Ugh. Um, like what, RP, being offloaded from the RPF? I say it's quite rare because they want to keep you. Yeah, but about 75% of the people don't make it through the RPF. They leave or they're offloaded? Yeah, they, they, that's what I'm saying. No, but which one? Oh. Offloaded. They, yeah, they kicked they him leave. out. Okay, got it. They kicked got him got out. It. The RPF yes, that is couldn't rare. even stand him. Yes, that is rare. Okay, so my point is the family member I lost wasn't even a family member who ever made an effort to even act like a family member, so it was no great loss 
Um, I still drive by his house every day just to keep tabs on him and feel like I'm, you know, giving him a hard time. Um, but no, my, my wife has really lost, you know, uh, everything that was really most important to her. I mean, aside from me and the girls, of course, but um, it's been very, very hard on her. And it's also why she doesn't contribute to any public conversations about Scientology. Yeah. She doesn't want to give her family oh, sense, any right. reason or excuse to go, well, I guess everything the church said about Heather is true. Um, because as of right now, the only thing Heather is guilty of in the world of Scientology is um, uh, staying married to me. And she doesn't want the church to be able to say that she's guilty of anything other than that. Um, uh, were you showing me? I, think I, was, I was just resetting that. I think we're back to I got it. where we're at now. Um, okay, good. Offloaded from the RPF. Oh, well, offloaded just means they kick you out. Yeah. They say, you cannot be here anymore. Oh, bye bye Right. Um, imagine now, now, imagine now, a box now, on a truck being offloaded. That's right. right. Now here, he, here's what might be confusing people. Yeah. They're probably thinking, well, who the fuck wouldn't want to be offloaded from the RPF? <laughs> you have to realize, and this yeah, is important to go on the record. Yeah. Look, it's easy to characterize the Sea Org members as prisoners. They're not. It's easy to characterize the RPF as prisoners. The RPF is a prison, but for the most part, they do want to be there. Now, they have been coerced into wanting to be there. It's but it's one of those, of it, it's a prison of the mind. Any one of those RPFers could walk out the door any day they want. And again, some people, when I say that, they think I'm being an apologist, that it's not okay, that, that I'm saying the RPF is okay. I'm not saying the RPF is okay. Mm. It's the same concept that has been said before, that if the FBI raided the international base, um, nobody would leave. That's right. Um, it's a prison of their own mind. Right. So those RPFers want to be there. They, they want to get back into the Sea Org. They want to finish the RPF. When you're on the RPF, you're not really treated or called a Sea Org member. You know, you're made to feel like you're not really, you're sub Sea Org members. Yeah. They want to within, become real Sea Org members. Within the context of the Sea Org, you are. That's right. Without, even, even though on the RPF, you're still better than a WOG, a non-Scientologist, right? Or a public Scientologist. Like, like when I was on the RPF, if some non if some non C org member talked down to an RPF her, yeah, they were called on the carpet because right. it's like, hey man, you know we're wearing the black and gray. You're not even here, right, right, sort right. of thing. You know, like, someone says it's going to be really awkward now if your brother uh, leaves Scientology and reunites with you. <laughs> no, it's not. I have when when my brother was sort of flo you know floating this idea that he was going to disconnect from me. I was like, I was indignant. I was like, you're going to disconnect from me. You're a shit brother. I'm like, you're an asshole to me. You're an asshole to our mom. You're an asshole to my kids. You're going to disconnect from me? <laughs> no, it's not going to be awkward at all. Um, okay, Chris, did the word clearing stuff ever happen to you uh, when you were on staff or only in the Sea Org? Oh, no, this was before. Oh, no, before. this was staff. No, this was when I was a public. I mean, yeah. what I was describing earlier about being browbeaten was when I was 15 years old and I was paying for courses. And that was the very first course I ever did in Scientology. It was a pretty high-level course. And that continued on throughout all my Scientology career. Right, right. Um, our PC folders under special security, I've seen interviews where people mm -hmm. say that a lot of people had access to them. Mm -hmm. How can a person completely trust the info and be used against them? Two separate questions here. Yeah. The church keeps PC folders under security from being taken out of the church. Mm -hmm. Within the church, though, those folders are under very minimal security. Pretty Any much, technical yeah. staff member, it's true. Yes. Any staff, staff member yeah. in the technical divisions, which is Division 4 and Division 5, Division 4 is where the auditing is delivered, Division 5 is where they make sure the auditing is being delivered correctly. Anybody in those divisions can look in any PC folder. You do right. not have to be a trained auditor. It does not have to be specifically part of your post responsibilities. Though they're not guarded in that respect, but they are very much guarded about being taken out of the organization. Yes. yes. Oh, absolutely. Also, Division 7. The executive, the executive division, division can look into any PC folder that they want. That's right. Now, the receptionist can't just walk in and be yeah. like, can I look at someone's PC folder? No, that person would probably be written up immediately for even wanting to look right. in someone's PC folder. That's right. Um, okay. What else do I got here? Wow, so many, so many spam comments. Um, there's someone lonely today who wants to fuck. Hey, look at that. Wow. Nice. I think we can fuck. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. Well, we could go on forever. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of questions out there. Yeah. But, uh, hey, what are you thinking of HowdyCon so far in Denver? Oh, it was great. I mean, I just flew in actually yesterday, uh, last night. Yep. I went directly out for some drinks and um, 
You've met Tony uh, before. Oh, I've met Tony many times. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I've met Mark and Claire before. Um, but I met a, a whole, you know, Steve, uh, I met Steve Kinane for the first time. Right. Met Peter Griffiths for the first time. Yeah. And um, it's going to be hard for me to remember everybody's names because also a lot of them sound familiar. I mean, a lot of the names are similar names. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's been a great time so far. We're going to go have some brunch here and then we're going to have a big dinner tonight. And then uh, so that'll pretty much, pretty much be it. Very low key, very relaxed and just having a good time. Yeah, yeah. Good times. Uh, okay, well, I guess we're going to wrap it up then. Cool. Okay, folks. So I, we see your comments still coming in, but uh, we have to call it quits because of the time factor. So this has been, uh, this has been well, Aaron's podcast or Aaron's video here live, but I'm going to uh, post this later as a podcast on my channel as well. I think that's the first time we've ever done anything like that, sort of cross-pollination. Yeah, yeah, we never channels. have. We never have. So uh, anyway, this has been fun, and uh, thanks for coming around and seeing us, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.